Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the service at St Andrews today. If I've not met you before, I am Sean. I'm the youth worker here at church. Something that you might not know about me, even if you do know me, is that I love watching crime TV shows, especially the true crime shows. But I'm only really satisfied if the criminal or the bad guy gets caught and locked up and justice is served. And I think there's part of all of us that longs for justice, for wrongs to be righted, for criminals to be punished. And we feel that when we look at the news too. I don't know if you, if you felt that this week, watching the news about Afghanistan. It's been devastating, hasn't it? And we long for justice and for God to intervene and to right those wrongs. One of the great comforts as a Christian is knowing that there's a promise that one day there will be perfect justice. Everything hidden will be revealed and every sin will be punished, totally fairly and totally justly. The parable of the weeds and the wheat showed us a few weeks ago that the righteous, or those who are right with God, will be separated and go to be with God forever, and the weeds will be taken away and will have eternal punishment. Today we see another parable that talks about that separation, this time with fish. So we needn't worry that those like Jimmy Savile or Jeffrey Epstein have escaped justice. One day everyone will be judged completely justly and rightly. We cheer, don't we, inside at that thought that justice being done by the one who will do it perfectly. But when we look at the Bible, at who is righteous, well, it makes it clear that none of us are in our own right. It's only through Jesus giving us his righteousness and being punished for our sins that we get the sure hope of life forever with him. So we're going to begin today's service by confessing together. Before I do, we'll have a moment of quiet. Let's say together the words on the screen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have not loved you as we should, or one another as ourselves. We have chosen our own way and ignored you. But merciful and gracious God, the Saviour of all who trust you, please forgive us and make us more like Jesus. For his sake, turn our hearts to love all that is good and true, so that we may live to please you. And we ask all these things for your honour and glory. Amen. Living as God's forgiven people changes so much and we long for other people to share that hope that we have. One way we can do that is by inviting them along to hear more about him, something that we've done this week as part of our holiday club. Have a little watch now of some photos that show you something of what we've been doing this week. What a brilliant four days it was. I know the leaders and the kids had a brilliant time, even the ones who got pied. Sharon's going to be praying in a few moments for the holiday club, but let's all keep praying as a church for the children who came, that the seeds that were planted will grow into lasting faith, and that whole families will come to know Jesus. Another way that we can express our unity is by saying a creed together, a statement of what we believe. I'm going to say the words in light type, If you'd like to, please join in with the words in bold. And if you aren't yet a reader, you can still join in. Your part is, I believe and trust in him. Please do stand. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, who created and rules the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Jesus known in the world? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of God's people, the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do take a seat and Sharon is going to lead us in our prayers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the blessings of the week that has passed. You have sustained and carried us through another week. 
We each experience very different things in our lives and yet you faithfully and personally minister to us in our own situations. Thank you so much for this tender and fatherly care we receive from you. Thank you also for the way that you've brought us together as a church family. You planned for our local church of believers here in Kendry to be loving and serving each other in our Christian lives. Please help us to follow your call, that we would live in unity with each other and help each other to love and serve Jesus together. Thank you for the opportunities that there's been this week at the Holiday Club to love and serve uh, one another and the many children in our community. Thank you for every child that you brought along. Thank you for each smile, each moment of fun that was shared. All of these things we know are wonderful gifts from you. We pray that you will be at work in the hearts of all those who heard about Jesus this week. Please will you help many people to understand that Jesus loves them and that he wants a relationship with them and that he has given his life to set them free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we cry out to you today for those people who are suffering in Afghanistan. Lord, this situation is way beyond our understanding and we commit this nation into your loving hands. Please be a refuge to those who are living in fear. Please comfort all those who have suffered loss and please bring life and hope where death and despair have taken so much from people. Father, we pray that you will strengthen our brothers and sisters who love you in Afghanistan. Please, would you give them the ability to stand firm, even in the pain and suffering that they are experiencing. Please, would you bless them with maturity in Christ and full and freeing assurance. Father, even as they are oppressed and opposed, would you make their lives so distinctive and beautiful that other people might be drawn to our Saviour, Jesus, and come to know him for themselves. Lord, we pray for all of these precious people. In Jesus' name, Amen. Next in our service, we're going to sing together. A song called His Mercy Is More. This is such an encouraging song, talking about how amazing God's mercy is, always bigger than even our worst sins. What a great comfort. Let's stand and give it some welly. Face in death I need 
Today's reading is Matthew chapter 13, verses 47 to 52. If you want to find them in your Bible or on your Bible app on your phone, or they're going to appear on the screen. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the blazing furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? Jesus asked. Yes, they replied. He said to them, Therefore every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of God is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me pray for Pete as he comes to help us understand God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that sometimes it cuts our hearts to reveal them to us, that we see the great need for Jesus. Please would you open our blind eyes and our deaf ears that we could hear and understand your word today and that it would change us from the inside out. Help Pete to be clear and faithful. Amen. Thanks, Sean, and hi, everyone. Over the summer, we've been working through a number of little stories called parables. Uh, parables are stories that Jesus told with a hidden meaning. And the parables in Matthew chapter 13 all tell us something about the kingdom of heaven. Well, now let me start with a question. I think it's fair to say that many people like to imagine that when they die, they will be in heaven with God. Here's the question. Do you consider yourself to be in or out? Would you say that you are in God's kingdom of heaven or not? If so, why do you think God will have you in his kingdom? If not, why not? Why do you think he won't have you? Well, there's one more parable for us, the parable of the net. In some ways, it's quite similar to the parable of the wheat and the weeds, which showed us that in the end, all people will be divided into one of two camps. Some will be in the kingdom of heaven, and some will be in hell. So like that parable, this one is very sobering. But as it sobers us, it prompts us to consider once more where we stand. Are we in or are we out? Are we members of God's kingdom and uh, are we members of God's kingdom or are we not? Are we safe or are we in danger? We might wonder why Jesus gives another parable that seems so similar in meaning to the one he gave only five minutes earlier. Well, Jesus may repeat this kind of idea because it is so important that his hearers, including us today, really understand the seriousness of not being in his kingdom. But there's a difference too. The difference is that the parable of the wheat and the weeds was about the world. Jesus actually says in verse 38 that the field where the wheat and the weeds grew up together is the world. And the message was that God's people, the wheat, will grow alongside those who are not God's people, the weeds. And they will only be divided on the day of harvest, the day when God will judge. But this parable is not about the world. It's about the church. I say that because verse 47 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. Back in chapter 4, Jesus told his disciples that he would make them fishers of men. So this fishing parable seems to be about the people who have been fished. People who have responded in some way to the gospel message and come into the local church, into the church family. And it's very sobering because we see here that even the church is a mixed bag. We know that the world out there is mixed. There are believers and there are unbelievers. But so too is the church. This parable of the net prompts us to ask ourselves two questions. Here's the first, it's coming up on the screen. When all is said and done, where will I stand? When all is said and done, where will I stand? This question is about the future. 
Let me just take us there to the future for a few minutes. When all is said and done, it's asking us to consider the end of our lives. When we finish speaking, when all is said, when we won't be able to blag our way anymore or excuse or, adjust, or justify ourselves anymore. When all is said. And when all is done. When work has long finished. When we know that we've had our last holiday or cut the grass for the last time or been to the doctors for the last time. When our life is drawing to an end. When all is said and done. When that time comes... Where will I stand with God? It's just you and him. Imagine that. Imagine just you and him. Where will you stand? What will he say to you? This parable effectively takes us to that time. It takes us to the end of the age, as Jesus calls it, when we will all stand before God. And it tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like a net a fishing net. We're told in verse 47 that all kinds of fish were caught in it. Jesus was speaking about a large dragnet, the kind his disciples would have used. It would have been dragged along between two boats, catching whatever fish were in its path. That's the way we've been sharing the gospel this week at the Holiday Club, isn't it? We haven't been fishing with a rod and a line, hoping to tell one person at a time about Jesus. We've been spreading the gospel net wide so that lots of people can hear the great news about Jesus at once. And as the church shares the good news of Jesus, all kinds of fish, all kinds of people will be caught in the kingdom of heaven net. Young and old, black and white and brown, rich and poor people, fat and thin people, healthy people, ill people, religious people, addicted people, clever people. Not so clever people, sporty people, techie people, beautiful people, and people like me with a great face for radio. All these different kinds of people are in the global church. All kinds of fish. Now what do the fishermen do once their net is full? Verse 48 tells us, When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore, then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. Of course, they weren't deciding whether the fish were morally good and morally bad. That's not what it means. Just whether they were the right size for eating. A good fish was a big fish. A bad fish was either too small or the wrong kind of fish. But there was a clear division with two clear groups. Good fish were keepers and the bad fish were leavers. It was a process of judgment. Now let's see the lesson that the Lord Jesus wants us to learn from that little picture. It's in verses 49 and 50. It's on the screen. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Just as fishermen separate and divide their catch, so at the end of the age there will be a day when God will separate and divide his catch. You know, I would really love to tell you that everyone in church is okay, whether you've come just once or twice or a few times, or whether you've been coming every week. That's what I want to tell you, because I want to please you and make you feel okay. I really do, but I can't. I'd be wrong and it would be unloving of me to do that. You see, the parable of the net tells us that not everyone in the net, not everyone in church is okay. And that is very sobering, isn't it? Because, well, look at where we are right now. We're in church. And this parable teaches us that even the church is a mixed bag. Well, now we could comfort ourselves and talk about the wider church, even our denomination, the Church of England, where it is ob very obvious that lots of people, even leaders, don't really believe in Jesus anymore. They are religious, but they don't love and trust Jesus. They reject his word and they teach wrong things about him and wrong things about the Christian life. Be easy to talk about them. 
But let's not do that. Let's keep it personal because at the end of the day, when all is said and done, you and I are going to stand before God too. So what is the important thing here? What is it that makes someone a good fish? Verse 49 says that God's angels will separate the wicked from the righteous. Let me tell you first what that does not mean. It does not mean that God has a set of cosmic scales in which he weighs our good deeds and our bad deeds to see which is heavier. Lots of people think that that is how things work with God. That he you know, weighs our good deeds and our bad to see you know, which way we're going to go. If there's more good, we'll, uh, he'll give us the nod and we can come into his kingdom. If there's more bad, we'll go down. People often say to me, I haven't done anything too bad. They're implying that they think they're going to be okay when God sort of weighs their deeds. But in the parable, the bad fish hadn't done anything bad. They were just bad for selling because they were too small or the wrong type. So if being regarded as righteous or wicked is not ultimately to do with moral goodness or badness, what is it to do with? Well, it's very simple. It is to do with how we have responded to and related to Jesus. It's to do with how we have responded to and related to Jesus. The word righteous means right with God. Jesus came into the world to make us right with God. Truly righteous people are right with God, not because of uh, anything about themselves, not because they are really good, but simply because they believe and trust in Jesus, who is really good. But as we taught the children this week, despite being really good, Jesus died on a cross in our place to take the punishment for all the bad things in our lives, all the ways we've messed up and mucked up, all the wrong things we've done, past, present and future. He died for all those things. The one who was really good died for all the really bad things in us. And here's the really good bit. When we come to him, when we come to the cross, when we come to believe in Jesus, his perfect righteousness and goodness, his perfect relationship with God is given to us. He takes our sins so that we can have his righteousness and so be counted worthy of being in God's kingdom. All because of what he has done for us. You know, believing and trusting in Jesus is the only way we can be right with God. Jesus would not have died if there had been another way. He'd have just told us what we needed to do. Do this and you'll be okay. But he actually told us we need to believe and trust in him as our saviour. The wicked people in this parable are not those who are particularly bad. They may actually appear to be very nice and moral and even religious. But God regards them as wicked because they don't and they won't love and trust Jesus as their Lord and saviour. Perhaps they feel that they are so morally good they don't really see their need for Jesus. They can see other people's need for him and the bad people, but not me, I'm, I'm okay. They may like the things that Jesus said. They may agree with lots of them. Some may hold an office in the church, but in their hearts, they don't really see their own personal need for the saviour. And Jesus calls them wicked. When Jesus uses the word wicked, he's not just referring to thieves and murderers and drug dealers and paedophiles and terrorists. He uses it to refer to anyone who will not humbly come to the cross and believe and trust in him for the righteousness that they need to be right with God on the last day. People who think they're good because of how they've lived but who continue to reject Jesus. It's possible to be in church as we are now but to not really believe the gospel 
to not really trust Jesus for a relationship with God and for forgiveness. It's possible to be in church as we are now, but to have a graceless spirituality, to say and do religious things, but to have no real love for God or for his people. It's possible to be in church as we are now, but for our hearts to love our work or our sport or our ambitions or our family more than we love Jesus. It's possible for us to be in church as we are now, but to trust our money or our mates more than we trust Jesus. It's possible for us to be in church as we are now, but for Jesus to just be a fringe character in our lives and in our thinking and in our decision making, rather than being the very centre and forefront of our lives. You know, God wants to rescue us from a gospelless religion, from gospelless religion and graceless spirituality. He wants to rescue us from dreams and desires that don't include Him and from a lifestyle where Jesus is nice but peripheral, just on the edge of things. I think people today generally think that they are quite good and that when all is said and done, they will probably be okay. That view is often based on how good we think we are, on what kind of life we think we've lived. As I said earlier, people will often say, I've never done anything too bad, or I I used to go to church, or I've always been to church, or I was baptised as a child, or I was a good parent, or a good husband, or a good wife, or, or just a good person. Have you ever said those kinds of things, or thought those things about yourself? Are you still putting your confidence in those kinds of things? Being baptised, being quite good, going to church? You know, Jesus saved his most severe words for religious people. For those who were always doing religious stuff and who knew so much, but who didn't really love and trust him. Let me put this very bluntly and starkly not in order to shock us but to help us to get this to to see why we need Jesus to see how useless our good works are the truth is by nature each and every one of us has more in common with Adolf Hitler than we do with Jesus Christ more in common with Adolf Hitler than with Jesus Christ. I know we haven't murdered six million people, but we still, by nature, have more in common with Hitler than we do with Jesus Christ. And that is why we all need Jesus, all of us. That is why without him we will be counted among the wicked on that day described in this parable. You can see at the end of verse 49 and verse 50 why that would be such a terrible, terrible thing. It says the angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a picture of hell. It's horrible. But it doesn't fully, can't fully portray the horrors of hell. Horrible though it is. Of being apart from God, separated from him for all eternity. Jesus says it's going to be a place of weeping, a place of the deepest sadness, and a place of gnashing of teeth, of deepest regret. What have I done? What have I done? Will be the eternal regretful refrain in that place. Well, that's why it's so good, isn't it, to have this opportunity to think about these things before it's too late. In verse 51, Jesus asked his disciples, have you understood these things? Yes, they replied. It's a good question for us to ask ourselves. Have we understood these things? It's worth checking, isn't it, that we're not just bumbling along through life hoping that we're going to be okay at the end. Want to be certain, don't you? When all is said and done, where will I stand? 
If you are unsure about the answer to that question, would like to talk about it, that's what me and Johnny and Sean and Holly are here for. If you want to talk about these things, well then we want to talk about them too. We are here to help. If you don't know very much about Jesus but want to find out more so that you can be one of his righteous ones on that day of judgment, then speak to one of us or phone one of us or email us. I promise we will help you. If you've been in church for donkey's years but are not really sure where you stand, then don't delay. I or whoever you speak to won't be shocked. Maybe you're aware that you've just been religious for a long time, but that you don't really love and trust Jesus. Don't let this word be snatched from you. Act on it before it's too late, before all is said and done. I'm just about done now, but you'll have noticed there's one last verse that I haven't mentioned. Let me take just three minutes on this one. The main question we've seen today is when all is said and done, where will I stand? But verse 52 prompts us to ask another question. If I understand, what will I say and do? If I understand, what will I say and do? Jesus' disciples have just said they do understand. And so Jesus said to them, verse 52, Therefore every teacher of the law who has been instructed about the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. The teachers of the law were professional teachers of the Old Testament, of the, of the law in the Old Testament. Jesus seems to be saying to his disciples, you guys are the new teachers. You are the teachers of the kingdom of heaven. They had received great treasure. They had received instruction and teaching and training about the kingdom of heaven from Jesus himself. And now he wants them to share it. To bring it out in order to make more disciples so that more people can be in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew's gospel is really about being disciples of Jesus who make more disciples of Jesus by sharing the treasure of the gospel. Jesus is saying to us, if you understand how important it is to be in the kingdom of heaven, if you understand how being, being good is not good enough, how all people desperately need Jesus, then don't be silent. Don't be silent with your friends and family and neighbours who I'm sure are very good and nice, but without Jesus, they're in big trouble. If in your heart you personally love and trust Jesus, then don't keep it in the storeroom. Bring it out. Just as we feel compelled to tell people about our holiday or our new phone or our new job or a new relationship or any, other, any number of other exciting things and good things, well, we should want to tell of the most exciting and best thing ever the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who makes it possible for all who truly believe in him to be in his kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. We mustn't keep it to ourselves. One day, we and all humanity will be divided according to how we have responded to Jesus, whether we are righteous or wicked, that is, whether we have really trusted Jesus or not. We will either be in the kingdom of heaven with God, enjoying him forever, or we will be in that place, that terrible place, where there is eternal weeping and gnashing of teeth. So when all is said and done, where will I stand? And if I understand, what will I say and do? Will you pray with me now? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross in order to bring us into your kingdom. Without him, we are in terrible danger. Please give us the grace to believe in him, to love him, to trust him, to live for him, 
and then to speak of him so that when all is said and done, many others may know with us the joy and freedom of being right with you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen. Our final song today is Where, O Grave. There is real hope and comfort for Christians, even as we look at death, knowing that we will get to go and be with God in his new kingdom forever. Let's sing together. Thanks so much, Pete, and thank you all for being here this morning. It's been lovely to see you all. Let me pray for us as we finish. Heavenly Father, sometimes your word is hard to hear, but we thank you that it always tells us the truth about ourselves and about you. We pray that the truths these parables have taught us this summer would stick with us, so that we would be the seed in the good soil, the wheat in your barn, the good fish in your basket, and that we would treasure you like a precious pearl and be part of your growing kingdom here on earth and one day in your renewed creation. Thank you that Jesus makes that possible by giving us his righteousness. Help us this week to keep him central to all our lives so we can honour and please you in everything. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks again everyone. I hope you have a fantastic week.